In a world filled with people engaging in selfish practices, taking time to celebrate the impeccable ones may just be a way to promote acts of integrity. In this episode, we present to you Dr. Christopher Calade, a man who modestly downplays his accomplishments that others celebrate him for. Despite his social status, he still played the piano for congregates right here. I'm Susan Illion. Welcome to Amazing Africans. Your Excellency. <laughs> Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Kolade. Clearly, Dr. Christopher Kolade remains one of the individuals who enjoyed a great measure of respect with the late accounting doyen, Mr. Akintola Williams. You are one of the men that the late Paul Akintola Williams deeply respected and strongly mentored. Fondly referred to as Nigeria's Mr. Integrity, Dr. Christopher Kalade was a colonial era education officer, 28 years older than the Federal Republic of Nigeria, counting from independence. He's one of those individuals like the late Doyen who exemplify integrity. Born in December 1932 to the family of the respected Venerable Abraham Oludiyimu Kalade and Mrs. Lydia Obafunke Kalade. Venerable Kolade was the first Anglican Archdeacon of Lokoja, the capital of now Kogi State, between 1961 and 1968. Dr. Kolade smoothly combined teaching and broadcasting, having taught schoolchildren via radio and later television. When he later took up full-time the broadcast profession, he rose through the ranks as Controller Western Region, then Director Programs, to Director of Television, and later the Director General of the Nigerian Broadcasting Corporation. He served between 2002 and 2007 as Nigerian High Commissioner to the United Kingdom. Christopher Kolade is married to Mrs. Beatrice Kolade, who sees him a little differently from everyone else. His love of God. We start our day here every morning by going into the Word of God, discussing the Word of God, and praying every single morning. So his love of God, in everything that he does, he puts God first. Dr. Kalade starred in the first film made in Nigeria in 1965 titled Taiwo Shango. The movie was featured on German TV and in Nigeria in the later 1960s. Award of Living Legend in Broadcasting presented to Dr. Christopher Kalade. He has received honors, recognition and medals both home and abroad, including the Order of St. Augustine. He also serves as a lay canon in the Anglican Church's Cathedral of the Holy Spirit in Guildford, United Kingdom. He is the commander of the Order of the Niger. Dr. Kolade served as the organist and choir master at St. Peter's Church, Fagi, Lagos, between 1988 and 2002, when he left Nigeria to become the country's High Commissioner to the United Kingdom. He is, however, honored with the title Choir Master Emeritus. When it comes to his lifestyle, moderation to everything, uh, his humility, not only that, the way he relates to everybody. I will describe His Excellency Dr. Christopher Kolade as a good man a good Christian, unassuming. I thought he'd be staying in Parkview, Victoria Island, Ikoyi. But then I went to see him in his residence at Ogudu in Ojota. 
He's so humble, very, very humble. I was asked to go and be chair of something called SHOP, the Subsidiary Investment Program. For the federal government, well, federal government was going to make the, the appointment. And my friends came to me and said, don't take it. Because the experience of others who have done the same is not attractive. So don't do it. In fact, there was a group of young people that I was mentoring at the time. And they said to me in a meeting, we respect you too much. Don't go for this one because they will. But I asked them again, by God's direction, I asked them a question. I said, so if I don't take it, if I say because I want to protect my reputation, I don't take it, whom shall I point to and say, you take it? You go and endanger your reputation. You go and do this. I said, so I cannot refuse to take it because I know somebody must do it. What I can do is to say, if I go and do it, God is able to see me through it. And that was what happened. So friends can tell me their preference. And sometimes I even have my own preference. But I remember always that I'm God's child and that he has my best interests at heart. And indeed, you took that, um, that title, that, that, that duty, and you changed things so much that uh, a woman, and many people experience this, but one woman wrote about you, titled, He Made the Difference. Which if you understand what the High Commission was back then and then when you joined, he made all the difference, explains it all. Can you elaborate a little bit? I know that there were pass passport issuance issues and all sorts of things that you had to tackle. When this lady came and said, I want to write this book, for me, the important thing was to say to her, listen, I did not come here to make a difference. I came here to serve to do whatever I thought the country needed in service, to do whatever I thought the situation needed if it was going to be better. Now, I had to ask for help, direction. When I received that direction, I simply obeyed what I was being led to do. So I go with relative confidence that even though I may be going into a new situation, I will be able to deal with it. Why did she want to write this book? Why titled He Made a Difference? What did you do that inspired her to write this book? I thought really I hadn't done anything that deserved being written in a book. But then the way she convinced me that she would write the book was that she then said, well, look, listen, there were situations that were going on. They needed to be changed. They needed to be improved. You came and met those situations. And you didn't just let them lie. You worked to change them. You worked to make them better. Now, that's what I want to write about. And for instance, take just one thing. Um, if you were living in Britain and your Nigerian passport expired, you had to renew your passport. The choice was, would you have to come all the way back to Nigeria to renew your passport? Which was a possibility, but was a very expensive possibility. Or could you, have, could you go to the Nigeria High Commission? which had a department for dealing with this kind of situation. So, anybody living in Britain would choose that option. But after my first couple of weeks, 
a group of professional Nigerian doctors came to see me in the office. And in the course of discussion, one of them said that he had just renewed his passport, but he had gone all the way to Nigeria to do it. And I said, but why do you have to do that? We have a department here that renews passports. And he said, ah, that doesn't work. They don't do it. You cannot get that kind of service. So I went down to the department where this is supposed to happen. And I discovered to my horror that there were passports, passports that had expired and were due for renewal that had been submitted to the department. What the department had to do was to renew the passport. And a man told me, my passport, my passport has been here for 15 months and I can't get it renewed. And I thought, that's not, I, I couldn't understand it. So I asked the people in the passport department, why would renewal of a passport take more than 15 months? What do you have to do? And they, what they told me what they have to do, I said, but how long should that take? So we discussed and I had to lead them in the discussion to show them that giving, renew, renew a passport for somebody was not a favor. It was a service. And that that person deserved the service. And eventually we got to the point where somebody wrote to me, a Nigerian, and said, I went to your high commission because my wife needed to renew her passport. I didn't want to go because I knew how tough it could be. But my wife has to go to Nigeria, so she has to renew her passport. So we went to the High Commission. We arrived just between 9.30 and 10 on a certain day, and we told the people what we came to do. We, gave the, we filled the form, we paid the fee, and they said to us, uh, this will take some time, so if you need to go somewhere else, please do so. But come back at 2.30 and your passport will be ready. And they didn't believe it. Because they knew that, I mean, you, you just don't do it like that. But they went, to, they, they stayed there, they didn't go anywhere. And at 2.30 on the dot, the lady was summoned and she was handed her renewed passport. Now, the man could not believe this. This is why he wrote me a letter. And what I then did was to call my staff together and say, I've just received this letter. And I read it to them. And I said, that's what you get when you do what is right. This was just an example of what I did. But you see, there was nothing sensational in what I did. Nothing special. I just said, this is a simple matter. They come, they give you the details, they pay the fee, and you stamp it. What's wrong? What's, what's difficult in that? You know what happened? I did not change any member of staff. I did not recruit new people. I did not increase their salaries. I did nothing that you would say was now an incentive. No, they just realized, look, we can do this thing in a few hours, so why take several months? And they did it. So that's why I said to the lady, why do you want to write this? There was nothing. If, if I had done something very, very big, sensational, there's something to write about. But I simply said, this is what, this is what you can do already. Why don't you do it? You are one of the men that the late Paul Akintola Williams deeply respected. And strongly mentored. Tell me about it. All right. When I joined Nigerian Broadcasting Corporation, 
Perkintola Williams was head of his firm, the accounting firm. And that accounting firm were the external auditors to Nigerian Broadcasting Corporation. So uh, that was how I first met anybody from that firm. But in the course of our interaction, it was possible for him to talk to me, and especially when I became Director General. Uh, so we had things to do together. And he discovered that you know, some of the thoughts that I had were interesting to him. So he decided to take an interest in my... I was much younger than he was. So he decided to take it. And eventually, he took such an interest that I felt I should really get closer to this man because he has a lot to teach me. But what happened was this. When I then decided to go away from that job of Director General, I was looking for somewhere in the private sector where I could continue my life. I thought, let me talk to somebody who should know. So I went to his office and I said, I'm thinking of leaving this job, but I want to go into the private sector, live my life and do so. So first I want to know if you think that's a good idea, but second, if I'm going to make that change, do you have any recommendations for me? He was very, very good. He gave me, first of all, the confidence that I was doing the right thing. But second, he then told me what the options were. And he said, of all those options, if I were you, I would think of going this way. He said, listen, you are Director General, Chief Executive of National Broadcasting today. Now, you cannot go into the private sector looking for a chief executive job. Because your experience in the public service is not a qualification for private, private sector. Therefore, you must start by understanding that you have a lot to learn. His mentorship of me was not just to advise me what I should do with myself, but also to say, if you're going to run a successful organization, these are the things you must not forget. These are the things you must practice. And you know, the, the final bit of this was that eventually uh, I became chairman of something called the Integrity Organization. And that organization then decided to hold an annual lecture in my honor after I retired as chairman. Re decided to hold an annual lecture in my honor. And while Parkinson was, was able to move about, he never failed to attend those annual lectures. He always was there personally as a sign of his personal support for what I was doing. That was something, it was an endorsement that was worth more than its weight in gold. Your wife, what role do you see her playing in the mission that you are also trying to fulfill? When I was asked to go to London as High Commissioner, we decided that we would travel together. So we moved together and we arrived at Heathrow together. But of course, when I arrived at Heathrow, some of the officers of the Nigeria High Commission came to the airport to welcome their new High Commissioner. Three or four of them, men, came to welcome me. She was with me. She was traveling with me. And she asked a question. At that point, 
She said, gentlemen, you come to welcome your new high commissioner. Where are your wives? And they looked quizzically at each other. She said, because when you come like this, are you trying to intimidate me? So they had to apologize that they didn't bring their wives with them and so on and so forth. But from that point on, two things happened. They now realized that their wives were a critical part of their mission. All right? But secondly, she then got the wives together and they became the wives of the embassy staff. And not only did she sort of mentor them on what they might be doing, but I think she made them realize that they were not just wives of officers, they were also on a mission. So suddenly, even I came to realize that really, whereas the man can be a high commissioner, and when he's in the office or doing meetings and so on, you can say that's it. But the high commissioner in essence is he and his family. What message do you have to tell the youth? To tell the youth, and I mean this seriously. You see, at all times, we need to ask ourselves, who am I? What is my essence? What, why am I here? Because unless you can unless you can come to some kind of uh, reasonable conclusion as to why you are here, you could be said to be, you, you may not understand why you are here. And when I look at the building of a nation, and I look at Nigeria, and I know that before I was born, there were some people in Nigeria who were building the nation who were doing things that have added up to what Nigeria became. Then I came into the world and I was able to see older people who were doing things. And some of them were even going to jail to, to indicate that this, they were serious about what they were doing. And I've learned from those people too. But Nigeria is now where it is because those people have behaved like that. Maybe not all the things they did were right. Maybe they were not correct on everything. But we have a Nigeria now. So, think 20 years from now, the future. If the Lord permits, will there still, still be a Nigeria? And if there's a Nigeria at that time, how will Nigeria be what should be then? It would be a, a, a procession of what these people have done, what we're doing now, and what the young people of today do to lead to that time. So every generation has something to do. The youth of today should just realize that they are not, they are not servants of the older generation. Journalism in your days of practice uh, and comparing it with now, what would you say has changed? What we did when I was a journalist, we did at that time with Nigeria as it was at that time, with the context as it was at that time. For instance, there was a time when I was working in public service and it was a military government. So my performance at that time was subject to the overriding decision of soldiers. So I had to be sensitive to that. There were other times when I was in public service and there were civilians. So that's, you see, you've got to know the context in which you're working. But the one that gives you the wisdom to handle yourself in any context. It's Almighty God.
comparing politics today of those of your younger days? My view of politics is that the practice of politics can be very, very sensitive. And uh, you can, one can begin to do things, begin to participate in decisions that conflict with the values, the standards, the principles that one believes. That has been my experience. I've never gone into politics because the way it was being practiced, I thought I would not be able to be myself if I became a politician. Now, that may be simply my own weakness, but this is the situation. And so, when I see politicians today and the way they behave, and if I compare today's politicians with the politicians of the First Republic, for example, I can tell if it's a very simple fact that my experience of the politicians of the First Republic was that they actually worked for Nigeria. They actually were serving the country. They put themselves, their own interests, lower than the national interests. And some of them, in order to serve the country well, were actually imprisoned. They suffered hardships in order to get the country to where they thought it should go. So the self was soft in the shadow. The country was. Now, I think that has changed. I believe that today many politicians, in fact, most politicians that I know of, tend to put their own interests ahead of the national interest. I hope you found his transparency and clarity in his approach to life as inspiring as we did. You can give us your feedback using the addresses showing on your screen. You can also let us know if you feel that someone should be celebrated. I'm Susan Illion. See you next time.